Chapter 8, Services and Relationship Marketing. Now, services marketing on its own is a whole subject, it's a whole domain. So the presentation is going to gloss over a lot of the depth and detail that's in the book because the key parts that you need to worry about with internet marketing apply across the whole of e-marketing. And that's customer co-production and the notions of co-creation. These are absolutely mission critical ideas in modern marketing. Now, co-production is where we are basically part of the process. We are required in order to get access to our product to make our product. The organization provides us with the opportunities, but without us working with the service provider, we don't get the outcome we're seeking. So in co-production with the internet is where user-generated content is absolutely vital to the success of a product. If we think about Facebook, we think about Twitter, we think about any of the social media platforms. If we don't participate, if we don't perform our role, it doesn't work. So in co-production, one of the things about this is that if you look back at your product model, co-production ties to the behavior aspect and the ongoing behavior aspect of the product. What is required of the customer to use your product? What is their role? What part do they have to play? If we take it something as basic as a video game where you need to participate, you need to engage your skills and abilities to get anything out of the game. If we take a camera, we take Instagram, if you're not taking photos, if you're not using the app, you're not getting any value out of it. So co-production really comes in when there is no value in ownership. There is no inherent merit in a product, in possession of a product, whereas the true value and the merits comes out of the use of the product. So co-production works really well in a lot of aspects of the internet, particularly when we start thinking about the internet as a vending machine, the internet as a self-service platform. Log into your mobile phone banking, log into your uh, internet banking, it's a self-service vending machine. Co-production, use their facilities, do it yourself, get the outcome you're after. It works, and it works because it creates value for us. It creates convenience, it creates control. So this is one of the other aspects to the self-service is we come across the idea of the self-service technology. We're seeing a lot of this in high technology and computing, in mobile, uh, particularly mobile marketing and in applications. The mobile phone becomes a self-service platform. And what this makes from a marketer's point of view is the self-service technology needs to have a couple of features. It needs to be predictable. When you press the button, the button does what you expect it to do. When you go to a mobile banking site and you go to transfer money between two accounts, the amount you specify goes to the account you specify. There's no randomized, there's no unpredictable component. Customization is critical. What you want to be able to do with self-service and a delegated self-service is give increasing levels of control to people who have the will and the skill to use it. What you don't want to do in self-service delegation is a one-size-fits-nobody, very basic or super complicated, so that people can't find their own value. So customization enables co-production because we can tune our operation, we can tune our behavior to the level of comfort we have if there are choices and if there are options. Similarly, the ability to trial links also to customization. Can I get this to fit my lifestyle? If I can, and it does, then I will use this, I will co-produce this self-service. And all of this adds up to the most important priority. Is it useful? Does it create value? 
So what you want to do with a self-service technology is ensure that the customer is actually getting value rather than you're just cutting costs. Because if you cut the cost on the assumption that the customer will just tolerate it and use the self-service technology, that is the wrong business decision approach. That is basically inviting the customer to leave, to go and take value from them whilst not actually, uh, well, particularly if you take value from them, if you go, we were previously charging you a premium, giving you a personalized service, now it's all self-service, but we haven't changed the price down, the customer, you've reduced the value the customer is experiencing. So coming into co-creation, co-creation really brings you a lot of opportunities. And we've done a lot of co-creation in social media, but also co-creation is where the customer uses the product for a means or a mechanism that you may not even consider. So this is the also the unofficial uses. This is the idea of the using Instagram to promote a novel. Each chapter is in the comments section underneath the Instagram people are sitting there going, surely there's better ways, but it's a use innovation. It's what value do you get by the way you do, by the way you act. So co-creation also comes out of the Varco and Loosh 2004, out of service dominant logic, solid theoretical framework behind it, and one of the most common things that we're doing at the moment. If you think about how you personally use your phone against how friends of yours and how family members of yours use their phones, the phone is the perfect co-creation platform. It's customizable, personalized, and the value you get from it comes from how you use it. Right, relationship marketing. This is one of the big areas. Came at, this was an area of controversy. When it came into uh, theoretical distribution, and uh, people were promoting this idea from 94 to 98, Relationship marketing was the highly controversial. Um, teaching a block of content on relationship marketing was a radical step to have taken back in 98. These days, it's a commonplace part of how we do business. The assumptions within relationship marketing are that you can either have a transaction, one shot, Go back to your behavior model, go back to your product model. That is product, behavior, one shot. Pay money, leave. And that is still a valid way of dealing. It's still a valid business choice. One shots. And this is where you can see a one shot transaction on the internet where you can check out as a guest. It won't store your details, it won't save your information, it won't store your credit card number. It'll charge you and dismiss you. And that can work. On the other end of the spectrum is the relationship marketing. At its fullest and most functional operation, relationship marketing is about a long-term engagement that's mutually beneficial. Customer and company both gain from being part of the relationship. Where relationship marketing sits at the midpoint, the transaction to relationship, is where the company benefits from the relationship or the requirement of a relationship, but the customer is not gaining anything. And we take here where you have to sign in, log in, create a user account, give over a whole bunch of personal details, and then they'll tell you how much the shipping costs on your product. That's not of benefit to the customer. So relationship marketing needs the mutual exchange, it needs the reciprocity. Inside relationship marketing, there's a couple of uh, theories that look, they border on being quite ugly. And one of them is the customer lifetime value and the calculative mechanisms at which we go and say, what is a person worth to us? Now, if we think about this, though, 
from the perspective of the different types of audiences, on the innovator to the early adopter, late majority versus early majority. The lifetime value of the customer is not birth to death, it's how much is this person going to be worth to us for the time they spend with us? Are they an audience we should divert resources to addressing? Are they an audience that we should avoid addressing because they will take away value from our core customers? So it is calculative. It does, there's a lot of work that's been done on promoting this. And you will have seen this. If you've been running Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook or Instagram, you will have come across the fake follower. And this is someone who is either a spam account, quite often a porn spam account. They are not a valued customer. They're not a customer that's worth addressing. They're not a customer who's even real necessarily. So a quick count, you look at them and go, I'm not following you back, or I'm going to block you, or I'm going to block you and report you as spam. That was you making a customer lifetime value judgment. And the value was this person's not, this artificial person is not worth giving credit by for ending. At the theoretical conceptual, and this is one of the most important frameworks in marketing. Relationship marketing as a marketing philosophy talks about trust, commitment, reciprocity. Trust has a whole lot of work that's been done on it, some very ugly calculative, what it trust comes from a mathematical equation that it is more beneficial to be loyal than to betray. Really ugly approach there. But also trust comes from that sense of, I can rely on the other partner to the transaction. Commitment is the value and the need to maintain. Now, commitment comes from value. It can be modified by costs associated with leaving, but the biggest cost of leaving is the loss of the inherent value of staying. So commitment, where you have value and you're creating value by being a trusted partner and the reciprocity is present, that makes this commitment a much more powerful mechanism. And the last aspect is reciprocity. And this is what's missing from a lot of relationship marketing tactics. Reciprocity requires both sides, customer and client, getting value. If we think about this from social media perspective, there is no reciprocity in having a thousand, ten thousand a million followers if those people are following you for the wrong reason. If you are gaining nothing back from them following you, they are not, it's not a relationship. This isn't relationship marketing if there's no benefit that you gain from them as an audience. Similarly, if the audience isn't getting benefit from you, then there is no reciprocity. If you are gaining because oh, I've got a million followers, therefore I can leverage that into getting sponsorships or free travel, that only works if they gain from what you are, from what you have done. If you're creating content that they are interested in, you leverage the size of your audience to create more content of interest, you have reciprocity. There are a variety of footnotes around it, which the book covers, but the other aspect is Reciprocity doesn't mean necessarily equal value exchange. I can gain more value so long as my partner to the relationship marketing believes that they are also getting value. Value is not necessarily objectively equal. So, trust is a central part of one of the barriers to the internet. It was one of the things that we spent a lot of the 1990s discussing how to deal with the barriers around trust, around authentication, around identity. It's come up again now with social media. Again, the last two years, uh, 
trust is a nut, has returned as an issue on the internet. And trust particularly in the aspect of we now have 20 years of stored internet data. How it's used, whether it time expires, whether someone is able to access your past from 15 years ago and throw that against you now. Trust has a whole lot of elements. Social media requires trust, and that's one of the things. This whole notion of, particularly around photography, around this, the presentation of the self, around revelation of who you are, your true self, there's a lot of trust. And trust is complex and multifaceted. As I mentioned before, trust can be calculative. It's worth more to me not to cheat than it is to cheat. Well, that's when marketing gets real creepy, all right? There's no two ways about it. It's creepy, it's ugly, and eesh. I don't like calculative processing and trust. Because that also is one of the fundamental philosophical problems of the way marketing is perceived, is that if we are calculative of, it is worth our time not to betray you. Trust doesn't get formed at a human level if we are basically going, well, it's not my interest now to betray you, because that definitely implies it might be in the future. Uh, trust also based future intent on past behavior. If you have been trustworthy, you are more likely to be perceived as trustworthy. Forgiveness notwithstanding. Uh, there's also the aspect of if you break trust, trust is difficult to regain. Lastly, trust comes from the network. If you are trusted by others, it is more likely that you are trustworthy. So this is where alliances working together, network groups, and also the mutually assured destruction of if I endorse someone else and that person becomes untrustworthy, my credibility is on the line, so I'm not going to spend it lightly, but also I'm not going to be keen to encourage someone to be calculative and manipulative in the fact that my credibility is riding on how trustworthy they are. The last two, transference, word of mouth, third party referral, trust by recommendation. Um, There's also things like endorsements where you can buy the little logos Heart Foundation tick equivalent for the internet. And motive assessment. Motive assessment's the thing that social media providers, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and the others, got wrong. They have always assumed that there will be a trustworthy partner and they have built with best case scenario. They have not looked at motive assessment in terms of what's the worst case. It's also a really difficult method of trust because it assumes that the exploitative party will be obvious. They will have a little hat that says bad person. They will wear a nice striped black and white hoop jumper and a little beagle mask so that you, like, you know that's the bad person. It's not that easy. So motive assessment is a very poor judge of trust. But it's also an area where as soon as you start going into this you can see stereotypes, you can see stereotyping, you can see lots of problems. Now commitment, this is the end game state. This is what you want. The purpose of relationship marketing is to have an ongoing commitment. So commitment is both a component and an outcome. You want this, it starts with people subscribing, it starts with the one-off behavior. So if your product has a behavioral component a one-off that is subscribe, sign up, log in, register, join. It's where they come back. It's where they pay you money next year. It's where they renew. That's commitment. And commitment has a whole, it can be done calculative, again, cost benefit, and can be done effective. Emotional, pleasure, satisfaction. You have Basically, there's a lot of work inside commitment. Again, we've been looking at this from the point of view of people because it's about people. You're looking at what commitment is a moderator. It will change your desire to leave. You'll change your desire to stay. And also, 
has an outcome in terms of if you are more loyal, you are more prone towards effective commitment because you gain benefit from being inside that commitment. If you're calculative and your trust is based on calculative behavior, then you are more opportunistic and less likely to commit. Reciprocity. This is the heart of marketing. Creation, communication, delivery and exchange. Reciprocity is the core of exchange. It's something for something. It's value for value. And without reciprocity, marketing collapses. Marketing needs exchange. Marketing needs there to have been a reason for me to transact with you. Reciprocity then forms a central part of relationship marketing because reciprocity embodies the transaction. Commitment and trust are the layers over the transaction which will encourage it to be ongoing. Commitment says, I will transact with you again. Trust says, I believe the next time I transact, I will get value for value like I did in this round of reciprocity. It also allows you to move. Reciprocity doesn't have to be equal. You can gain, if over time you feel it will balance out, you can start with a greater gain or a greater loss than your partner if it evens out over time. So one of the other aspects of the chapter I want you to think about is in the levels of relationship marketing, its tactics are one of the things that you are currently engaged in doing in social media. Anyone who said that they want to increase their follower counts to gain followers, to create loyalty, Welcome reciprocity. At a tactical level, it's all about the incentives. But incentives only create reciprocity. Commitment is keeping people without the incentive. Trust is value will be there once the incentive period is over. On the strategic level, this is where relationship marketing works quite well. That you think about this in terms of, I have a longer term goal Therefore, to achieve this longer term goal, I will need to ensure that I keep my customer. At the philosophical level, relationship marketing is a philosophy of marketing. It is the idea that I am here to engage with another person and to engage with the market for a long term. It takes it away from this idea of short term, short termism immediate gain to there is a sustainable ongoing relationship or there is the potential to create a sustained sustainable ongoing engagement and that is a philosophy that is a business philosophy and you can have a non-relationship business philosophy where you are in it for the short term snatch and grab get as much as you can and get out of the market move in sell cheap Make cheap, sell high, get out. There are ways of businesses operating like that. Relationship says we will take the time to work with the customer, to keep the customer, so that in an extended period of time, we are still benefiting and the customer is still benefiting. So that's services, briefly, and relationship marketing. And relationship marketing is your big fundamental core that makes a successful social market, social media marketing campaign and makes a successful social media engagement. Trust, commitment, reciprocity. You trust your audience, your audience trusts you to provide the content. The reciprocity, you gain from the audience, the audience gains from your content. Commitment, you'll be doing this again tomorrow, the next day, and the years after that. So that, those are the three keys. That's the way it'll work. And relationship marketing is your big, strong, um, theoretical framework that can engage. And also kind of answer the question of whether you know, e-marketing, if you take a relationship marketing approach to e-marketing, it is not about e-advertising. But if you take a transactional approach, it's all about the advertising. 
all about people onto a mailing list so you can sell them something else.